I believe it was 2014, Baylor hired a sports dietitian. And I really feel like that's kind of when the NCAA changed a lot of the rules, regulations regarding feeding, fueling athletes. And I don't know what the straw was that broke the camel's back, right? That's way above my pay grade as far as big decisions like that being made. But I share all that to say, like, I'm really happy for NCAA athletes now. Hello and welcome to the Eat More Carbs podcast. My name is Jenna Fisher and I'm here with my co-host Riley Beatty. Today we have sports dietitian Sam on to help answer some questions and talk a little bit more about her experience. Sam, for those listeners who don't know you so well, can you take a couple minutes and introduce yourself? Howdy y'all. My name is Sam Marisek, originally from the Buckeye State. Went to school down in Texas where I ran cross country track and field. And that's really what piqued my interest in becoming a sports dietitian. So these days... A uh, bigger company in tow. My husband is active duty and we have two little ones living on the East Coast where I work as a consulting sports dietitian. We're so excited to get to ask you some questions today and kind of pick your brain about sports nutrition and also a little bit about running. Before we get into some of those questions though, we do a high and low segment where we share just a little bit about our week, the good parts, and maybe the parts we wish had gone a little bit differently. Riley, do you have a high and low this week? Yeah, I'll start off with my low because I usually start off with my high. So I'm switching it up this week. Low for the week is we haven't talked about it in a little bit, but we're really big into our plants at the Eat More Carbs podcast. My low is I've not been doing a really great job at taking care of my plants. There's lots of things going on right now. Obviously, my plants are not like thriving. They're surviving and I feel like a bad plant mom. So it's kind of my low. I need to get back on the plant priority wheel, we can say. I feel bad for my plants because I see them every day and I'm like, I need to be better. I need to be a better plant mom. So that's my low. My high for the week. So this past semester, I taught at our local university in town called the College of Charleston. I taught just like basic nutrition. We had a sports nutrition section in it, but basically it was just basics of nutrition, introduction to nutrition. One of the assignments that the class had to do, they did a semester long project where they had to track their energy intake, track their energy expenditure, and then do like an analysis and kind of compare, provide recommendations and things like that. My high part about all of this is when they submitted their final analysis and reflection, I was so shocked that all of their recommendations were like positive things to focus on. Something that I was really nervous about is like diet culture. And obviously at Eat More Carbs, we have a food first approach. We have a positive approach on nutrition. And that was really reflected in their papers. They always all focused on like, I need to add more fruits and vegetables. I need to add more carbs. I need to add more protein instead of like, I need to take all these things out. That was just a really nice surprise because hopefully that means that they learned something during the semester. Great teacher. I hope so. (laughs) We'll see when they do the (laughs) report back, but I just, I thought it was really, it was really nice because sometimes you think like they're maybe not listening to you or things like that. So it was, it was a nice little surprise. Sam, what about you? High and low? High and low. I'll start with high. This week has been a lot of fun work-wise as far as being able to do some more creative things. This is obviously up there on the list. Did an open house collaboration. So featuring a model kitchen, did some live cooking demo, but some really fun real estate people, and some exciting potential partnerships in the work. So that's always fun, right? New experiences that are work-related. Flip side of the coin, a low. I think it's, (laughs) I find it funny. So I mentioned in my intro, right? We have two kids. One is five and we have a three-year-old. So typical parenting fashion, right? I'm in the same room, but I'm not really paying attention to them. I'm like, oh, they're fine. They're getting along. Do, 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 do. And so our five-year-old, her name's June, and she's like, we're going to get you a snack. So I'm like, okay, just responding to work emails. Again, not paying a whole lot of attention. So our three-year-old goes upstairs and brings down June's tea set. And don't know if it's a little boy thing, but he was like, I'm going to get you some something to drink. I was like, oh, okay. Like he knows how to scoot a chair over, pour water. Fast forward, they bring it over, we're eating it. And I'm like, I don't remember hearing him scoot a chair and I wasn't paying close enough attention. I'm like, Jameson, where did you get this water? As I'm like sipping it out of the teacup, eating the goldfish. He's like, doesn't mess a beat. Toilet. And I was like, and of course the five-year-old's like, Jamesy, that's disgusting. Yeah, so we had toilet tea. I'm sorry I'm laughing, but that might be the best (laughs) slow week I've ever heard. Buckle up, Riley. (laughs) I like don't know like what to think. Like, 
first of all, like, so smart, so resourceful, like, yes, <laughs> but also toilet tea. Oh my, I'm dying over here. True story. Oh, wow. That might be I the best love that we ever had. Hands down. Toilet tea <laughs> made the list. So great. Okay, my high and low comes nowhere near toilet tea, but I will wrap up our high and low section. My husband and I live kind of close to Camelback Mountain and there are two trails that get you to the top. One is kind of known for being a little bit more moderate. The other one is a little bit more intense. So we had done the more moderate side of Camelback and I didn't really think I was ready to do the more extreme side of things, but we decided the other day we were going to do the more but extreme side and it was way more fun. It was so much more like scenic and beautiful and it was just so much fun. It was shorter, it was faster and we got up and down really quick and so it was just a great thing to just, you know, sometimes you think that you can't do things, but you really can. My low for the week, my dog has to take very expensive medicine. And instead of going to the vet and picking it up, we went to like a local grocery place that said it was going to be an affordable place to get his doggy <laughs> medicine. And they were going to charge us $600 for 120 pills. And thankfully we have those like good RX coupons. So it took it down to like 70 bucks, which was about what we play- paid at our vet anyway. But I almost had a heart attack. And they told me that that's how much it was going to cost. That's brutal. George would have been worth it, but oh my gosh. <laughs> oh yeah, I still would have whipped out the credit card and been like, just put it, and just don't even think about it. But So Sam, we're really excited to have you on as a fellow sports dietitian and answer some questions. I'm going to let Jenna go ahead and kick us off on our questions. You kind of Ooh. answered this just a little bit in the intro, but how did you become interested in running and how did your journey to become a registered dietitian kind of intersect with your running career? Yeah, Jenna, Riley, how much time do we have? <laughs> So my parents both ran gr- growing up and uh, right it's kind of monkey see monkey do to some extent and then I'm the oldest of four so we all grew up playing sports and for the majority of sports minus like maybe swimming right a couple others that come to mind running is the basis of any other sport right and so Grew up playing soccer, basketball, kind of your typical little kid sports. And then middle school rolled around and the middle school didn't have a soccer team. A lot of my friends were going out for soccer. Riley, I know you're a big, big soccer fan. I was like, hey, mom, dad, why don't I just like go out for select or do a travel team? And they're like, no, you're one of four. No, right? Because then they have to allow the younger ones to potentially do it when they're older. So I was like, okay, well, I want to do something. Found out cross country is a no cut sport. So that's obviously a no brainer. And you got popsicles sometimes after practice. So I was like, all right, this is awesome. And running, like, let's be real. You don't have to be that coordinated. Can you run and follow a course? Can you run in an oval? Okay, you're on the team. And uh, never looked back. That's really how I got into running. And I think the follow-up portion of that question, correct me if I'm wrong, was how does that intersect with being a dietitian? I think a lot of runners and dietitians, they really coincide because of course there's that correlation between performance and what we're consuming. And so in high school, I felt like I really struggled with balancing that aspect of wanting to be better, wanting to be faster. And as a distance runner, right, it's this bell-shaped curve when we're talking about performance or perhaps, right, the Goldilocks phenomenon. I was able to run competitively in college, but right, the stakes are so much higher. And I I would say, maybe y'all, you know, want to chime in here, but it's almost like when we're talking about disordered eating, eating disorders, any type of negative potential in regards to eating and, and athletic performance, it's like asking a fish what's water. It's just very, in some institutions, very common. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it, it is what it is. And so when I was a competitive athlete in college, we didn't have a sports dietitian on staff. And so that was really like, wow, this is so important, but it's at, at the time wasn't a readily available tool at our disposal. And so I realized, hey, not only is it important for athletes, but until we die, most of us are going to be consuming energy, right? Most of us aren't going to find ourselves needing interal nutrition. So I was like, hey, this has application. Even if I don't want to work with athletes, obviously I do. But if I didn't, right, it can apply to any facet. I think that's one of the coolest things about nutrition is that we're all sports dietitians here, performance dietitians. But if we really wanted to, like we could go into the kidney space or we could go, we could change career paths because nutrition is applicable to everybody. Yeah. And I think what's what's great about the athletic population from my experience having a decade in other healthcare areas, they're very motivated populations, sometimes to their own detriment. 
Do you mainly work with athletes now or do you see a variety of different people? Yeah, so I would say primarily, I would lump it under the umbrella term of active individuals. So, right, some collegiate athletes, so obviously very competitive, and then working with, hey, maybe I'm training for my first half marathon, my first full marathon, or I've had the opportunity more recently to connect with moms who are getting back into this new normal that they have now that it's mom and baby and just the postpartum transition of not only physical ability, but also just the changes that come with having a a baby and having to, I will say like, Hey, what I was easily able to do pre baby is a lot different now. And I think sometimes that's more of a potential, a mental, more of a mental work as, as opposed to like, Hey, like follow this workout plan or follow these nutrition guidelines or ranges, so on and so forth. And so that has been super, super rewarding because I'm learning, right? As, as a parent of a five and three-year-old, so much of what we do, they pick up on and I don't even realize it until I'm like, oh man, I don't know if that's something I want you to pick up on. It has definitely been a very, like being pregnant for the first time and we're, I'm so thankful for it, but it's definitely been a very humbling experience. Something that has been really great for me to go through, I think professionally and personally, because it's just... Just a reminder that like sometimes things on paper do not match up with our life. I've given this example a couple of times, but I was really sick in my first trimester. And when I was like looking for information online, like how to, you know, fuel in the first trimester, everybody was like, you need to eat a salad because you need to get the full acid from the spinach. And I was like, I'm literally surviving off of Sprite and ramen right now. Like I can't even look at a vegetable unless I like, you know, it's putting me in the bathroom. So I think it's definitely a very like humbling experience. And especially like working with these active moms, it's something that I think is really important to have you as a resource to have gone through it yourself. Yeah, yeah. In addition to the sports dietetics background or CSSD. Last year earned my, I'm sure y'all are familiar with intuitive eating and the principles of intuitive eating. And I, I tell the individuals I work with like, Hey, these are our navigational buoys. Like if, let's quote Jimmy Buffett here. Let's keep it between these two right here. That's my kind of advice because you can't really have one without the other, especially right when you're working with athletes who are transitioning from like one life stage to another, or maybe going from like competitive to weekend warrior. And it's like, okay, this is the way we've been programmed to eat for performance. At this point, like your needs are going to change. Body composition is going to change. How do we find a happy space where you're still able to incorporate that activity you enjoy doing, supporting overall health and wellness for long-term health, right? And the change of tuning into hunger and fullness cues, coping with emotions with kindness, rejecting the diet mentality, all that fun stuff. It's such a fun and challenging journey to take with a client. So it sounds like you work with lots of different individuals, mainly active individuals. What are some like the biggest mistakes or nutrition myths that you're seeing with your clients? Yes. Okay. I would say first and foremost, underfueling, right? Whether it's intentional or unintentional, maybe it's a busy individual trying to balance or juggle a lot of different daily demands and they're underestimating what what they're consuming and don't understand why they're fatigued. The opposite example would be someone who's intentionally under fueling. So we're talking about whether it be disordered eating an actual diagnosable eating disorder or red S. And I would say those are the two primary. And then third place would probably be someone looking to just take a quick shortcut, right? Of course, there's lots of information out there. So, hey, where, where are we finding our performance nutrition fueling info. Is it a evidence-based source? If not, okay, like that's an easy fix. Let's not read BuzzFeed. Let's not look at TikTok. Let's go over here to the CPSDA research library. Also bonus points. If you can't fall asleep at night, you can go over to the research library. Just read that. You'll fall asleep. So uh, yeah, I think in a nutshell right there, those, those would kind of be the three primary under fueling and then shortcuts. I think that's a thing that Riley and I also see a lot is under fueling, but especially with the shortcuts, like everybody is initially looking for a quick fix. We just talked to an athlete just not too long ago who was talking about how she was hesitant to work with Riley because she knew that she wanted a quick fix. And so how do you help people kind of like overcome that mentality of looking for a quick fix and kind of 
of help them realize that it's it's beyond just like a snap of the fingers. Oh, yes, yes. The million dollar question, Jenna. I think it's having an open dialogue about, hey, this is what I'm willing to offer. This is what doesn't make me feel icky. You know, if you're not willing to compromise or consider my practice philosophy, then I want to be so respectful of your time and resources. I'm more than happy to refer you to someone else. Like no harm, no foul, no hard feelings. Like I want you to get in a place to work on. And if they aren't necessarily to that step, then I'm not the best sports dietitian to work with them. And maybe people are like, oh my gosh, Sam, that's so mean. But I would want someone to tell me that like, hey, I'm not the person for you. We're very similar in our practice as well, especially like with all of our client athlete packages, like everything is at least like minimum four months because we need some time to practice these behaviors. A lot of, I know athletes are like, hey, can I just meet with you for an hour? And like, that's not really gonna accomplish the goals that you want. You know, you have this laundry list of things that you want to accomplish and meeting with somebody for 60 minutes. Yeah, it might be super informative, but it's not gonna give you that quick fix or that big change that you think it's going to. Agree. One hundred percent. I do really want to ask you about like your career as a runner because you ran in college, you ran collegiately. You're training now for a fifty K, is that correct? That is one hundred percent yes, accurate. Oh my gosh. I can't I can't imagine running that much at a single time. It's just a lot a lot of running at a single time. So I have so much respect for you for that side of things. But I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about like looking back on your running career, especially when you were in college in that super competitive space. Like once you became a sports dietitian, is there anything that you would have like changed or wish you knew about fueling since you didn't have that access to a sports dietitian when you were at Baylor that you would have like wanted to know or maybe changed kind of looking back on that? So many things, so many things. I think when we look at college, right, it's so many changes for this young adult taking place. For, for me, it was like, okay, what are the most successful athletes doing? I'm going to try to emulate some of the things they're doing. And honestly, <laughs> some of those things weren't based on what we know now and best practices, right? Aligned with optimal performance, going back to the shortcuts, right? And I know you guys have a group about period recovery, so important. Again, fish, what is water? It's like, oh, I'm taking birth control, so it's good. I'm healthy because I'm still menstruating, even though it's like synthetically. And if I had to go back, right, I'm getting lost in the weeds, but if I had to go back, I would say advocating more so for, hey, can we have someone if it's not full time? Because we have all of these student athletes injured. And even though I'm not a dietitian, like I'm reading about this and this seems like the antithesis of what is being promoted. We're getting advice that seems to be pulled out of a magic hat and arbitrary numbers thrown at us. We had DEXA scans completed, but I don't know that results across the board were accurately interpreted, shared. Like what, what was the purpose of that? Who so was I doing guess, the DEXA? Who was reading the DEXA if you didn't have a dietitian? Strength trainers. And then we were getting advice from coaches and like, I'm sure they were coming from a good place, but if you're a coach, like you don't have the nutrition background and it would be like, Hey, like you look like you've gained weight. What's going on? It's like, well, you didn't notice when like I was like a broken toy on the shelf. Like, why is it a problem now? Even though like, you know, Hey, like there's gotta be some kind of accountability. I graduated in 2012, I believe it was 2014. Baylor hired a sports dietitian. And I really feel like that's kind of when the NCAA changed a lot of the rules, regulations regarding feeding, fueling athletes. And I don't know what the straw was that broke the camel's back, right? That's way above my pay grade as far as big decisions like that being made. But I share all that to say, like, I'm really happy for NCAA athletes now because that's, if you don't have a sports dietitian, if, if, it's, if not full-time, if you don't have a consultant option, th that's very much the minority. Hey y'all, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Eat More Carbs podcast. We hope you're enjoying our interview with Sam. Next week, we will release part two of this episode where Sam dives into a little bit more about her training and running ultra marathons. We will leave all of Sam's information in the podcast show notes so that way you can reach out to her if you have questions for her. You can find her on Instagram 
Instagram at the dietitianist. If you have questions specifically for Riley and I, you can always leave them in the comments below, or you can find us on Instagram. We're at the eat more carbs podcast. You can find Riley on Instagram at riley.beatty.nutrition, and you can find me on Instagram at jenna.fisher.nutrition. Thank you again so much for listening to this episode. Please make sure you rate, subscribe, and review. And as always, remember to eat more carbs.